Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Texas Atomic Iron Pour, uh, Iron Stories, um, Iron Views, I am sorry, of the title at TWU. Uh, I want to do some thank yous before we jump in. First, um, thank you, uh, Blake Weld, for your help and Colby Parsons. Um, and the rest of the faculty for supporting the Iron Pour and being excited and the students as well. I'm gonna kind of roll through some other thank yous. Our amazing uh, students who are in charge of social media and Kelsey, you'll see her work in a minute. Um, and most of all, thank you to um, Kurt Deerhog, Aaron Cunningham, Luke Sides, Andrew Scott, Philip Shore for coming and, uh, and putting on a fantastic iron pour and uh, um, coming back to finish with a lecture. Our iron pour ended up going a little bit um, off schedule. So this lecture made it into the virtual realm. And I am so excited to see people here. Um, Blake, if you notice anybody coming in and I sometimes I forget to push the admit button, help me out there if you're here. So I am Tanya Seinar, Texas Women's University. I'm, I'm pleased to uh, go ahead and launch this. And I want to start the way we're going to do this is I've alphabetically um, cataloged the speakers. So I'm going to do a quick little um, beginning and then we're going to turn it over to Aaron Cunningham and each speaker will be sharing their screen and telling you their amazing, sharing their work with you and telling you about their amazing experience in seven minutes each, hopefully. Uh, so that we can get through everybody. So I'm going to go ahead and share and hopefully this, we didn't do a test. We'll see if this works. In honor of the wonderful work that is happening, I bring you no sound. Dang it. Apple iron. I want the whole university to go, what is going on over there? Because we're making so much noise. Right? <laughs> yep, how do you feel? Good. Good. You guys are going to do different from us. You're going to come this time. Here so you go. Can you drop this guy and try to clip the court right in? All right. Um, <laughs> what an amazing, uh, just amazing refresher of what we went through. Um, the energy, the students, your energy. I can't say enough about that. Uh, we, we broke out of the pandemic, um, knock on wood, uh, but we did it with style and you all are uh, a big part of this. So Aaron, are you ready? I'm going to turn it over to you, Aaron Cunningham. Sure. Thanks, Tanya. Good to see everybody in the virtual space. Thanks for showing up for this um, today, given we couldn't do it last time. I will go ahead and just get started here, portion of screen.
Okay, can you guys tell me how that looks? Are you seeing just the slide? Yeah, cool. Okay, so uh, just gonna try to go through this quickly, talk a little bit about my work, um, my background and how I got to using iron, why I use iron, and then also just kind of the community aspect behind that. So for me, my background is small metals. And when I went to undergrad at Art Institute Chicago, and then got into grad school at UT, this is work from UT, I was working with small non-ferrous metals, more wearable sculptures. And then there was a big, not a big jump. There's a lot of work I'm not including, but I just think that my tendencies as a metalsmith still lead into what I do in terms of iron, but also it speaks to like iron compared to small metals can be a real pain. <laughs> so I always think of iron as like, it's one of those things of why did I decide to do this it's sort of my arch nemesis? Cause it's so much harder in a lot of ways but I say that it is, but it's very applicable to my work um, that I'm doing now. So this is some of the work I used to do. I still do some of it. And then uh, one of my first iron pieces I did in grad school was full iron piece was my thesis show. And so I was doing these pieces where I started to um, work on doing more of the body casting. And so for me, casting in general, I like to think of it as it gets beyond this sort of surface incident straight to the idea of presence. And that's not only body casting, but metal casting. So with certain pieces I make that you'll see, there's this like graphing, um, isolating and embellishment of a female form um, that I think shifts the experience of a body from one based on these societal parameters into one of a more intimate personal investigation of surface. And that's sort of what happens with some of these. <laughs> Um, so I have an affinity for using cast iron because of its ability when it's combined with these lace textures to communicate some powerful dualities of masculine and feminine, disposable and precious and fragile and strong. It does have a long history as an industrial material, but at the same time, it possesses a visual aesthetics that help to elevate its status when used as a sculptural medium. I use iron to also elevate the view of a female body from standard notions of beauty to visual and metaphorical elements of strength. And so there's a couple pieces that sort of fit within that framework and concept. This one's actually aluminum. <clears throat> then there's this, uh, I'm just showing a couple series of works I've done over the years. So this is um, a couple years ago, I started doing a series called Press Fit. And that's derived from a technical definition um, where it's in relation to engineering or mechanics. And it talks about which uh, it's a fastening between two parts, which is achieved by friction after parts are pushed together rather than by other means of fastening. Um, so that's another view. And so then also with this work, the flames and plaques capture mundane folded spaces of the female figure and casting them in unfamiliar light. It's also kind of, I think, reminiscent of this sort of extravagant Baroque style frame from a time period in art where what was considered idealized and beautiful of a female figure is, you know, um, vastly different from what we look at today and how we make those um, judges of uh, beauty. So as far as using iron, this was my professor from the School of Art Institute of Chicago, Carolyn Otmers. I was really fortunate to have a um, really strong uh, female mentors as my instructors in undergrad, my metals professors, my first foundry professor being Carolyn, my first iron pour she took me to my first conference. And so that was always really important to me. And this is from SLOSS. I got to, I reunited with her after like 15 years um, after the conference. So they really laid the foundation for me and learning foundry and casting. I just didn't know how it fit into my work yet, but they encouraged me, you know, to really sort of continue to explore that. Um, I met this guy in grad school. This is Donnie Keen. I think I got invited to a symposium in Houston at Keen Foundry because of Kurt and Butch Jack. I met them somewhere along the way. I'm not sure I remember exactly where. Um, sorry, of course, my dog's now gonna start barking. Uh, and so Donnie, basically a lot of the work you just saw was cast at Donnie's, you know, uh, over the years. And I learned so much working at places like Sloss, but at his foundry mostly because of um, just his, his skill in industry and his openness to letting artists come in and having the patience to sort of work with us, open up his space. 
uh, but really teach us a lot. So when we have these symposiums and this leads into conferences is we're learning this really uh, interesting um, application of pouring iron based on his skill set in industry, but also, you know, this sort of, he always calls it fellowship. And I always like that. There's this sort of fellowship that comes along and anything like even the pour we did the other week. And so, you know, we're working with him and learning from him as a teacher, but also we're learning from each other. This is a huge group of artists. We come from all over the place. You make connections, can talk about your work, you know, your creative process, your technical process, exchange ideas. And these connections have really led me to a lot of opportunities through the years. And so um, that's one thing I really value about this community. Um, and these are some of the folks that are here with us today <laughs> that I've gotten to work with over the years. And again, coming up to y'all's poor is because I've be, been able to meet these people through some of these um, conferences and symposiums. The other thing about it is it's taken me all over the country and all over the world, you know, going to conferences and exchanging these ideas. So this is, I got invited to pour in Corpus Christi on the beach with them, uh, the desert in Donnie Keene's place. Um, just, that was a wild trip out there. Tanya here with you, just gotten to pour with some really men, uh, amazing artists. This is Mary Neubauer from New Mexico. Uh, I've gone to Alaska and done a pour. What I don't have images of of some of the international conferences is like going to Wales, going to the UK, Germany, you know, next year. So uh, it's really kind of given me an opportunity to travel to these places, especially if you can sort of make it into residency, Sloss Pharmacies in Birmingham. And the most recent one was Germany in summer of 2019 with Kurt and another really great group of artists. I got to go there and focus on uh, I didn't do as much of the 3D printing, but trying my hand at some 3D printing and metal casting, but just getting yourself in a new space, a new environment, um, and creating new work, but also just, you know, it's, it's working with other people, making those connections, and I think Iron is, in that community, has allowed me to go to these places and meet everyone, uh, and so that's just to end with one piece that I did in Germany, and so that's my story. Unmute. Uh, I'm unmuted. Yeah, unmute now. Uh, Aaron, thank you. Uh, beautiful work. Wonderful to hear the story and all of these images. And it's really, <clears throat> I, I want to, to ask the audience um, to please kind of remember any questions you have. We're going to save the Q&A for the last part. So uh, a lot of information just came forward. So I hope you have questions for Aaron once we get done with everybody. So thank you again, Aaron. Kurt, you wanna take it away? I will, I will. Kurt Deerhog. Well, I wanna thank everybody for attending and it's so great to see everybody. Um, hadn't seen you for all two years. Now I see you two weeks in a row, like within two weeks. So. Um, I teach at Lamar University in Beaumont, Texas. I earned my MFA at the University of Minnesota and my BFA at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. Um, of course, as, as Aaron has said, I've kind of co-coordinated the Keene Boundary Invitational Symposium. I've gotten the Texas Atomic Iron Commission up and running and uh, co-coordinate the International Symposium. Uh, that takes place in Germany with Luke. And then, of course, I'm also the co-chair for the International Conference in Berlin, Germany in September of 2022. Um, I, you know, I want to say that I've been in love with iron for a long time. And I didn't think I was going to fall in love with iron because I was a printmaker and I hated anything other than printmaking. And my printmaking professor said, you got to take sculpture. And I thought, oh, hell. And it was a really uh, tough one for me. Uh, that was my last semester uh, as an undergrad. But fortunately, I had this great opportunity. Um, and, and, and I'd say to people in the audience, take advantage of those opportunities. But this one was the local foundry, Smith Foundry. This is their furnace. It's an induction furnace. It only taps out, it only melts about 16,000 pounds at a time. But their contest was to 
for the art students to come and make a mold, make a mold, bring it to the foundry, have it poured for free. And then they were gonna put it, put together a show for us at a downtown Minneapolis gallery space. So how could you, how could you not want to take advantage of that? Because I didn't know anything about anything about anything. Not only sculpture, I knew how to build things, but not very much about sculpture and certainly not about foundry. So that was a place that I kind of started falling in love. This is like going back. And and and, and uh, you know, it was smoky, it was dirty, it was, it was smelly, it was just great people that worked there. And you can make art. It was kind of like printmaking, so it was all right. And that's where I first met my professor, Wayne Potrax, uh, through that whole process. And, you know, I had no expectations of going to Lamar Un or, uh, University of Minnesota. Um, I just, just kind of it had happened. But, um, and I had no uh, expectations of being a foundry person. It, it just happened. It kept pulling me. And that was the, the piece that I cast at that, that foundry opportunity was a really big shoe. That was me. Of course, I was skinnier, had hair. And of course, those beginning castings, you know, and you probably, you know, you will fall in love with those, that, big, that work you start, you're doing, you fall, you love it, right? You have to. But then at some point you go, oh, this stuff. And I look back at this and I, and I shake my head and think, well, what was I thinking? And they're big clunky, not big clunky, little clunky objects. Um, I, 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 but I learned a lot. I learned some of the techniques and how to push the envelope and moved on from there into bigger things. Uh, and this was shortly, this was like in 1988, I'm sorry, 98, excuse me. And it was, uh, you know, a few years after my first conference in Sloss Furnaces. And, and I, I went, I came back after that when I'm, I'm building a furnace. And then I started taking my furnace all over the place, like you saw up in Texas Women's University. And this is a piece that I poured at Franconia Sculpture Park, um, about a thousand pounds. This is our foundry at Lamar University. And I could have swore that that might be Tanya in the white helmet, but it's not. And I too have great, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, I've had opportunities with Smith Foundry and working there and working with the artisan resident, John Poole, and then getting a job at Lamar University and working with Butch Jack, and then getting to know Donnie Keene and how generous he was. Cause it was, it was all about, you know, oh, I need a mold. I just go over to Donnie's and make a mold. And he gave me the key and, and we would just go and do it anytime I wanted. He's retired now, which it really breaks my heart, but it was a really great 20 years. And some of these things like this has nothing to do with iron, but you can see that when I first started Lamar, I was, I was graphic design and I had to teach this animation stuff. But nonetheless, I hated it until I figured out I could make things ahead of time and then build them. They could use them as a blueprint, and which I did. So it, it, everything was at that time was all about iron and I had to have something iron. And then it was always, well, it'd be wood and iron. Um, it was always about industrial forms, maybe nautical forms or uh, aeronautical forms. And, and, and some of it was always trying to get iron into the into space, but you know, without making it where I needed like eight forklifts to get it up in there. So these are some you know works done maybe a decade ago, but in a lot of smaller work. So big, you know, larger work, outdoor work, and then more intimate. Uh, smaller work, and, and of course, obviously, much more colorful with applying paint and sanding and more paint and sanding onto the surface. So then I got, I, I got this bug. I went to Japan uh, with Aaron and, and Tanya, and I, I think that's it. And, and, and then right after that, I got invited to come to Germany to build a furnace with Greg Ruder down at Corpus Christi. And I've been, I've been there ever since, about every, every summer. Last summer, I, no, the summer before I didn't go because of COVID. But um, that was another game changer because they had a 3D printer. And I never 3D printed, but Hans, right here, he's got a, he's got a fork in his mouth. And, and he had a 3D printer. And so I printed probably the most awful thing. And it came out in three parts. It was supposed to come out in one. And I glued it together and fixed it with wax. It looked like 
I, I, it looked like the worst model airplane that one would ever make as a kid. Um, but then I've gotten more into it. And so I'm torn between 3D printing and cast metal. My love is cast iron, but I'm, I'm, I'm starting to really enjoy the 3D printing aspects of it as well and making larger objects in 3D printing, multiple objects, pushing that envelope and then putting metal coatings and putting patinas on there. I'm, I'm making this one in wood because I thought to myself, well, this was stupid. I should have just made it in wood to begin with. And then I realized, God damn, that's taking a lot of time. I already have this the cast iron forms done. So um, nonetheless, here's some shots. So define your space. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you. Wow. Awesome. Amazing. Um, okay, I will we'll just roll on down. Um, um, Phil, you're next. You want to take it away, Philip Shore? Oh, let me get back here now. Hold on a second. Okay, now we should be. So I'm, I'm Phil Shore. Uh, I teach at the University of Dallas and I thought here we did all this pouring and we have this bare metal and what do we do with it? Well, for a number of years, I did large fabricated public artwork and I became totally enraptured with the patination process. So I thought I'd show you a little bit of uh, what I go through with uh, patinas. So, a lot of times when we put patinas on, we start working with oxyacetylene torches or something that's very hot. Um, I use this system with a, a propane tank and this warming uh, torch. So you actually are heating a broad surface um, and you don't want it to get really hot. You wanna, you wanna make sure that when the metal or when the patina hits the metal, it evaporates and it doesn't run, but it's not hot enough to bounce across the surface. So these are the tools of my, uh, what I use. All the samples I'm gonna show you are uh, done with a spray bottle or a brush, um, but it's really important to make sure that you wear, uh, you know, safety glasses, respirators, um, gloves, protect yourself, use ventilation if you have it. Um, I'm, I'm friends with the owners of the Sculpt Nouveau company um, and they, they gave me, Tanya, when were we initially doing this? 2019 was when we had planned on it. So yeah. Sculpt Nouveau donated all this material to me to do tests and um, do a demonstration. So this is kind of the carryover from that. Um, so uh, this is the torch and you can see that center knob that adjusts the idle flame and then that trigger or the, the toggle switch gives you the hot flame and then you can dial it back. Um, and it works really, really well. So you don't have to turn off the torch and turn it back on and turn it off and turn it back on. Um, the other thing is that uh, we don't think about steel and iron holding a lot of moisture, but it just wants to go back to the earth desperately. So this you'll see the evaporation of the moisture that's within the steel. And you wanna make sure that your iron or your steel is, uh, sandblasted just prior to patining. Otherwise, you have that rust uh, coming up. Whoops. Okay, so here are some samples. What I tend to do is cut out uh, a sheet and then I write on the back what I'm doing. So this is a 
a red patina with ferric nitrate and then potassium and then ferric nitrate again. Um, the surfaces that you can get are, are marvelous and they're extremely seductive to do. This is one that I just, I love and, and just playing with it and seeing what happens, you'll have disasters and then you'll have these incredible experiences. So this is using a brush and dipping into the patina and then holding it when it hits and you get this sort of tortoise shell effect um, and so then here I talked about the dioxide white sprayed on uh, and then the, the stealth green diluted with a brush. So I know I can go back and say, oh, this is how I got this. Here's another one that's, I don't think quite as successful, but it's nice. Um, there's a there's a copper patina that they make and I've played with it a little bit, but I don't I don't have enough experience to really know. But this this kind of marking along the bottom, that's the copper patina. Here's another uh, really nice patina. It's using a uh, a brown and a tan and then a Verdi, so we, you get that, that green patina that comes up. So then, interestingly, when I, I was making these large 20-foot outdoor sculpture pieces, I moved to Texas, and instead of things always being bigger in Texas, everything shrank for me, and I shifted to working with wood. But the patinas, have always influenced how I work and I've actually used the patinas onto wood surfaces so that that green on the tabletop that's actually a patina that's rubbed into the surface. Uh, you can see the foot is a is a patina surface. Kurt talked about the metal coatings that's actually a metal coating that's patinaed. And on the right you can see the the wooden column how I've used I it's milk paint and I've developed that way of working to make it have a sense of the patina to it. Um, so here's a couple more, same thing. I'm working with the tool and how I apply it and then, then pull it off, uh, which is the same process that happens when I'm patining metal. Uh, so, yeah, we're getting ahead of ourselves here. Sorry, that's, that's another example, but you can really see, I think, the connection between the patina work and how I treat the surfaces of my current sculpture. So I, I took a, an axe head and I, I took a mold of it and cast it in wax and plaster and I carved them. Um, and so this tree is a, a lodgepole pine. Um, and then uh, on the back side of it is a mountain pine beetle. Um, and they have kind of an interesting relationship. Um, there's a, a cast uh, cicada wing that was treated. And that, that mountain pine beetle, that was all cast at Donnie Keene's foundry. So you can see this community keeps rearing its head. Um, and so then this is a, the last piece. Um, but again, th there's that association to the, the surface treatment of the patina and how it's carried over and through my work. Uh, and I wanted to thank Ron and Debbie Young uh, from Sculpt Nouveau for donating the patinas and thanking Tanya and all of those who made it possible for us to have this community come together. Uh, that's really important. I appreciate everything you've done for this whole community. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. That was wonderful. And just a quick note, side note, um, the previous iron um, pour that we were going to do at TWU involved Phil doing this actual demo. So he's continued on to prepare for this lecture, but this would have been a live demo 
three years ago, three yeah. years ago, I think. Pre-COVID. <laughs> Pre-COVID, like a year before COVID. So um, thank you. Um, I just realized I can't seem to get my alphabet right. I mean, I'm, I don't know how old I am, but it, it so Andrew, alphabetically, you should have been in Phil's place. So I, I think I want to just turn it over to you now because I'm supposed to do this alphabetical thing. That's what my rule and that I made for myself and I messed it up. So okay. take it very, away. Very well. I hope folks can see the slide. Um, I, um, I, this is really wonderful. And I think the, the theme, creating community sort of encapsulates and resonates most strongly with me. I think the last time I was at Anayampur was uh, before I relocated here to Texas from Savannah in 2014. So it's, 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 it's been a while um, in, in, in any case. Uh, but uh, my interest in uh, casting processes and foundry processes like Kurt came out of an interest in, in uh, computer modeling and 3D printing. And at SCAD, I, I was the uh, coordinator for the sculpture department there. And currently as a bio, I'm, I'm an associate professor of art and technology over at um, ATEC. And the way that I got into computers was through sculpture, which was kind of weird back in the eighties. Uh, but that's where my interest in computers derived. It derived out of sculpture using them as tools of design. And now like Kurt using them as tools of manufacture. But, uh, and I've always thought about a lot of these uh, com uh, computer technologies and com computer graphics technologies as sort of like intermediary tools in the process of sculpture. So how do we do this to get there? And the interest in casting, uh, when I discovered the 3D printers at SCAD, my mind went almost immediately to casting pro processes and figuring out how to uh, uh, transform these uh sculptures into other other materials through casting processes and this is sort of the uh this is sort of the iron uh cast that uh, was derived from that computer model it's approximately 12 inches tall and i was always really amazed at the uh degree of detail that you're able to capture um using um using uh the computer graphics as your as your first first case positive what we didn't have back then, a lot of these models were casted in what they called ABS plastic. But what we didn't have then were a lot of the um, the soluble plastics that you could use that you could directly uh, invest. And I did a lot of uh, exploration in that area, but a lot of it was uh, in bronze as a material uh, where I would create these FDM models and then uh, at, Figure out how to uh, use shell process processes, then to, to then take them into the foundry and, and cast the work in bronze. And a lot of times, as in this case, after I finished casting the work, I went back and welded other parts onto it and and, and continued to work on it. And uh, and also uh, I also have like a, a an obsession with patinas because it's yet another opportunity to play with fire and to color with fire, which I always find uh, very, very interesting. And here's another uh, example uh, from this series of work. Um, and this was my uh, Cerebus uh, piece, uh, Alcozo. Uh, in Kisi, it's like a two-headed dog. And this is uh, also another work that moved from uh, the process of uh, 3D printing into, in this case, it's uh, bronze casting. Um, are we seeing these uh, faces on the side there uh, on my screen? Uh, trying to kill this window. See if I can kill this window. No, I'm going to go with it. Uh, get back to this world. Uh, my my trade as I was the sculpture coordinator, I was coordinator for sculpture on the Savannah campus, and we had the sculpture major in Atlanta. And this gets into the realm of the uh, topic of fellowship and community. And one of the ways that we're able to create community between the two departments, uh, the department in Savannah and the department in Atlanta was through bronze and iron pores. 
And these were sort of like coordinated uh, with our faculty in uh, Atlanta, Alan Peterson, who I'm sure many of you probably know, uh, and also uh, with uh, Matt Tool, who's also another person that many of you probably know and are, are familiar with. And this was one of the principal ways that we were able to glue the two departments together was through this fellowship of the Fellowship of Foundry as expressed both in bronze casting and as you see here in uh, iron, uh, iron pouring. And it was kind of interesting because on the Atlanta campus, they had the foundry. And in many ways on the Savannah campus, we had a lot of the digital tools. And so it was a really interesting uh, uh, fellowship that went on. And when we were up, at, when we were up in Denton a couple of weeks ago, uh, my mind went back to these times and these moments of fellowship and of coming together and of community that we're able to build through this medium. And that's, I think, is one of the really most beautiful and interesting aspects of this work in, in Foundry is that it's one of those art forms that you really can't do alone that you need other people and it's dependent upon cooperation and, and all the things that bring people together. And I really love that aspect of it. And, and, and I also uh, like, you know, this is like always the favorite part when something is revealed out of the shell and you see it for that first time. Uh, and for the students, it was always a really sort of a profound experience. And there's always beer and food or drinking food, I should say. Uh, and, and <laughs> as a part of uh, this communal experience. And I think it's those um, aspects of, of uh, this whole process that have the most sort of a profound effect upon me. And, I, and, and that's why being out there, and thank you, Tanya, and everyone that was involved in that pour, that was, uh, that was, I was like on edge for about five days after that. Uh, because it was like, oh man, I found my tribe, I found my tribe, I found my tribe, you know, and, and, and I was sitting there and I was going, I was like, these folks don't know, but the next time if the music's playing, I'm going to dance, <laughs> you, you know, so I've, I've started like uh, uh, diving in uh, to, you know, methods, thinking about methods of production and some of the things that I might want to do with this media because, more importantly, it's not so much the work, it's being a part of the fellowship that is, is the part of it that I want to continue and look forward to as we as we move forward. So I say thank you to all of you and everyone and thanks for uh, letting me into your, let me into the cool kids party. <laughs> thank you, Andrew. Yeah. That was fantastic. And you're very welcome. Uh, uh, we don't know where you've been all this time, and, <laughs> and I'm glad, I'm glad you could make it, it's perfect, and there will be many more. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, and um, so let's move on to Luke. I, I know we're going over, we have gone over a little bit, and I will say I intentionally might, made my short. Now let's see if I can get <laughs> to that, but um Luke, you want to take it away? Sure. All right, so uh, I have uh, been doing this iron thing for, for about 15 years. I uh, went to grad school at that other school there in Denton. Uh, and I came to iron after grad school. Um, I didn't know many people that did iron. I didn't know anybody that did iron. Um, I knew of Butch Jack, but I was in grad school. I was thinking about going to grad school, and Lamar didn't have a grad school. So uh, it's going to be weird, but I went to grad school before the Internet. So, you know, right now you can find on Facebook 15 people that do iron. Um, but back then it was like, uh, you know, you'd have to physically travel or hear who's doing iron right uh, so I, I i want to reiterate all of the things about the community uh the community is great um in many aspects the community uh the community can uh, overshadow the production of artwork and i think that's something that i am constantly aware of that uh 
that it's nice to get together and it's nice to um it's great to get together and 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 talk and and uh discuss all these great things about sculpture but uh, it really boils down to making artwork and sometimes in these iron pours it becomes just about pouring of the metal so uh, i wanted to just say that right out right out in front there so this was a uh, a piece i did in uh Germany. So uh, again, I, I did a lot of the things like Kurt did. We our, our lives kind of parallel with each other quite oddly in many ways. But just like Kurt, I was introduced to 3D printing at um, in Germany. It, it forced me to to do that. So uh, that was a giant 3D printed pig head based on a scan that I did of one of my actual sculptures. Uh, this one, I'm, I'm going to just kind of go through the my iron portfolio, really. So I, I started casting iron in New Mexico at Tucumcari, and that's where I'm, I met a lot of people in the iron community and then branched out from there. Donnie Keene, that's where I met him, uh, David Lobdell, uh, and all these things end up to where I am today. So this is a chili dog. Green chilies are uh, real big in New Mexico, because so this is kind of my ode to New Mexico. Um, cast iron and, and ceramic shell casting. Most of these are gonna be ceramic shell. Another piece, uh, another pig. Pigs are very popular in iron. Um, the material's pig iron, right? So a lot, a lot of people do pigs. Uh, and so I, I noticed that, and so I kind of tried to do my my twist on pigs, and I spent a lot of years doing doing pigs, and uh, I haven't done a pig in a while, so I'm kind of taking a break. This is this might be the very first one I did, and so a little uh, piglet with bacon wrapped around it, so kind of revealing you know the the what is consumed on the outside of the little cute piglet, right? Kind of a attraction and disgust type thing right um i'm really drawing drawn more recently to digital fabrication uh, i did not like the um the the giant 3d printed pig head uh, this is a 3d this is a printed this is a piece that i did where um I cut all the pieces out on other pieces of plywood that I cut out on a glow forge on a laser cutter, right? And then you stack them up. There's a <clears throat> there's a program that you can bring in an STL and do all those great things too. And and this was what much more satisfying to me uh, making this out of plywood than the uh, the giant 3D printed ones. And it may be it may just be because of my scan. I might need to rescan those. But I really I'm really enjoying uh, all out all the uh aspects of digital as many aspects as i can of digital fabrication i want to continue to to learn more about that in my research this is uh this is called high on the hog this is made right after ember uh guyer she uh shot the guy in his apartment so it's all about police and pigs and so pigs can be any there, there are a number of things but they're also what police are call it a lot of times right so uh there's there's some badges there made of bacon and sausages and then there's the the base is actually a cage in and of itself so uh, this is in my front yard my neighbors i don't think my neighbors understand what it is or my relatives or they'd probably break it so uh maybe one day they'll figure it out but uh to me it's fairly obvious but they just see the pink pig and like oh that's nice so that again all of those Elements are cast iron, and then the steel uh, tubing is is just steel, right? And it's all patinaed and painted and all that good stuff. Smokey the Bear, uh, again, kind of uh, using little smoky sausages as the fur. All of these are, are somewhat of a of a uh, self portrait of myself, so um, kind of a Smokey Bear type figure. I love smoky sausages. I love to eat sausages. Iron pours are kind of a sausage fest, right? There's a lot of dudes. Uh, so, um, you know, we try, to, we try to limit that a little bit. So 
I, I try to hit on all, all aspects of a certain topic until I can, until I exhaust them all. So sometimes they're, they're uncomfortable and sometimes they're funny and, and that's uh, all part of it. Right. So iron lady, uh, Margaret Thatcher. And so the, uh, union Jack is kind of impaling her head up in the air. She was not a, I guess, I guess half the people liked her, half the people didn't like her. So, uh, but she's prime minister of Great Britain, referred to as the Iron Lady. So I went through this portrait phase of casting these iron, 80s iron people in iron. So that was uh, the Iron Lady. Then uh, these are iron sides. Uh, a, a friend of my brother's, his dad always called us iron sides, and I didn't understand why. And, and there's an old gas can, an old company that was called Ironsides. And so uh, we, I kind of adopted that name using that as a, as kind of just a signature deal here. And so these are all, ca these are all cast iron at Donnie Keene's foundry. These are uh, giant waffle fries, right? And then there, there is a, the steel fabricated case. There is the, uh, the waffle fry, you know, from Chick-fil-A. So the logo is based off Whataburger. And again, that's cut out on a, a CNC plasma cutter. So I like to use just about anything I can. Those, each one of those are about 50 to 75 pounds and they're about 18. I think the biggest one's about 18 inches and the smaller one's about 12 inches. Uh, and the, the, the container itself is probably 30 to 30 by 24 by 36, something like that. A little sausage brain, weenie brain. So one of the pieces I made during uh, COVID, right? So uh, I always got I always got sausage on the brain. I know that sounds weird, but you know sometimes it sounds weird. It's okay. I uh, we all are probably I don't know about all everybody. Maybe maybe not. But I'm sick and tired of politics. And I am obviously sick of more than one more on one side than the other, but this was my frustration with both, both, both sides. And so this is called "We're All Suckers," um, and so it's a blow pop. And there's the the elephant and the donkey, colored purple, cast in bronze. And this is uh, one of the first pieces that I was able to do completely in. Uh, digital format, creating it completely in a 3D program. Most of the time before, before these pieces, I was scanning pieces in and bringing them in that way. So that, that's all I've got. Thank you, Luke. Thank you. Woohoo! I'm already getting comments coming in. Um, from students on, on these uh, different works. Um, awesome. Well, it's great to see your work and hear what you're doing. We're, uh, we're at six o'clock now, or 6.04. I'm, I'm, my talk is probably going to be kind of fast. And I ended up going back into it and and I just want to say about this kind of talk is not what you're going to put in it and what you're going to say, but it's what you're going to take out. Because when you've been doing things this long, this many years, oh my gosh, I think I had like 70 or 90 slides and it was like, wait, this won't work. <laughs> so I tried to shorten it and um, hopefully you're not scared. So I'll go ahead and screen share and take her away. I can remember how to do that. Okay. All right. Um, I'm being a little cheeky, but I'm not. And this kind of piggybacks with uh, what some other people did talk about. And Aaron, um, my... Uh, my, uh, my interest in iron began with bronze. And so the reason I, I put that in here is just to 
try to talk a little bit about that. And I geared this talk really for the students, but also it's good to share with each other. I know many of you have seen my story over and over. And so maybe this is new for some of you. Um, I have to give a shout out oops, to my father, uh, who I was fortunate to grow up in a family uh, of artists. And uh, I remember the sound of the iron furnace at night, You just that roar. And, um, and so this is my father, and he's in the Wichita Mountains with one of his sculptures, bronze castings. And so this is my work from undergraduate. Uh, uh, I really had an opportunity to, look, to learn with the person who owns the company uh, uh, with Ron. I, I learned from Ron's, a print, one of his uh, disciples, I guess is the best way to put it as an undergrad at Colorado State University. So I learned about patina formulas and also was very interested in working with bronze. Um, so these, there's no paint on these uh, bronze castings. They're all, you know, there is some pigment in the patina, but it's, it looks like paint, but it's not. It's all done with heat, it's done with the torch. Um, and these were old um, solid investment casting with plaster and sand. And then they were cast in multiple parts and then I welded them together. And so I was interested in the vessel. I was interested in artifacts, um, ancient um, cultures, uh, their tools, their weapons. Uh, and then I started getting interested in, in this kind of inverted landscape. And that's another bronze. I don't remember how many parts I, that was cast in, but multiple parts, you have to get to be a good welder. So moving to iron. Uh, in graduate school, I, I, my goal was to work in iron. Now the irony here is this mold is covered with bronze ingots. And that's because uh, one of my graduate student, student or uh, 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 colleagues uh, in grad school was uh, getting some major commissions in bronze. He was a public artist. He came over from China to work on his studio um, art, but ended up going back into commissions. So I had to borrow all these bronze ingots to use them as weights to hold down this um, mold because I was having trouble with the tops lifting. I, you can't really see me, but this is uh, my professor on the right, Norm Taylor. Uh, so my, I didn't have the strong female metal co connection um, it was men. And so I got kind of masculine myself. Once a massage therapist meant, told me I had a lot of male energy. Um, so it's just really all dirty and, and or, or, you know, uh, I guess just acting like a guy. But uh, influences with the landscape. This is, uh, even though there are beautiful uh, images out there that don't have this seam from a book, I can't let go of this one. I can't find it. Um, um, it is from a book, but these are some of the things I was looking at is my connection from undergraduate into graduate school. I went more to an elemental earth kind of level where I started thinking about the landscape. And this is in Oklahoma, just a two, couple of hours from me. It's the Wichita Mountain Wildlife Refuge. So I looking at this kind of structure and sensuous, bulbous uh, surface of the earth, but it's all, all originally, this was molten. So in grad school, I knew I wanted to transition out of the bronze work. So after one or two things I won't show you, I made this. And I think it was kind of approving for my, um, to my professor because I walked up with this big wax and said I wanted to do this thing 
And he gave me just a real brief way of doing it before leaving for the evening. And the next day when he came out in, there was a 500 pound mold on the floor. And that was me doing, you know, getting ready to cast this. I wanted fire in it. And so I built a, I learned about um, uh, central heating uh, pilot uh, flames and um, burners. And so I made a system and plumbed it and then discovered that you, if you have fire in your art and you have even a propane tank in your art that once had propane in it, you won't get it in a show. So, and back to grad school, the finale was um, to cast a really large piece. And so this is 11 feet tall, 13 feet wide. And um, it was cast in seven sections. Um, can, kind of can't believe I did this um, without Donnie Keene. <laughs> but this is my father. Uh, I, in a panic, he came in the last two weeks um, of my production trying to get this ready to install for my thesis show. The clock in the background, it says, uh, what, 1.30 or 2.30. That was not in the day, that was in the morning. Um, we, we put this together, it, I guess from start to finish, it was 90 days. I had to became, become a project manager and people donated their time because it was such a monumental or large piece, it wasn't really monumental, but um, I made sure everyone was fed and then they got bronze artwork as a gift. Um, for helping me. I had some people stick with me through the whole thing. So this is kind of my introduction to iron community. And this is the work in, um, in, in the thesis show in the Henry Art Gallery in Seattle. It's, I became very interested in what happened when you poured the iron in the metal and then you opened the mold and the earth, or it, it made me sink and feel the earth. And that is what you're seeing on the bottom. That ring is made out of powdered coal and a little bit of bentonite. And it's 13 feet in diameter. First, I made both of them 11 feet. And anytime you have a vertical and a horizontal, the vertical is going to make the horizontal seem smaller if they're the same size. And I found that out the hard way. I put it together and it looked really dumb and I had to expand it and redo it. Um, it's a close up of the powdered coal. I was very interested in the kind of ephemeral nature of something. The landscape is moving constantly. We may not be seeing it unless we live in Hawaii and you're seeing the lava flows, but that through erosion, through uplift, through subcutaneous things, the earth is, is constantly shifting. And that really interested me. And so for students, I just wanted to talk about that a little bit, that transition out of the way we see and think from, from these more pristine objects, I went more into a direction of really going back to um, what's happening in the earth, the element of iron. And so I'm just going to go through these for the sake of um, time, but these are all showing the process of making the big ring. Um, you wanted to make sure it didn't deform at all in the molding process. That's why I had to build this big structure and have it split into sections. And that my mind doesn't work that way. I had to really tap some people that could think that way to help me design this. One was, it was an undergrad student that helped me work this out. This was a, one of our TW iron pores that, that Kurt was a part of. So to the elements, thinking about the earth. Um, also, I started, you know, I don't know how many years ago, but thinking about um, what's out there, the galaxies, the, that, that, structure at place that we only see through telescopes or if we're you know lucky enough now to take a, a spaceship and um started thinking about how could i turn that into a surface and through um through different 
processes are able to kind of assign depth to light and transform it to almost a topographic surface. So this is from a project um, called Iron Galaxies or Mapping Galaxies in Iron. And this is machined in HDPE. Um, I think I'm saying that right. And I, I just fell in love with the plastic. So I have not cast this in iron, but I, I might go back and start casting some of these star maps in iron. These are imaginative ones. So going to all these amazing iron pores with these, you know, going back to what Luke said, it's sometimes you get lost, you forget you're making art because you're wrapped up in the iron pour. I've forced myself to have something for these pores. And then when I had them, it was like, what do I do with these things? And so they're little kind of imaginative fun, in my mind, nebulas and galaxies that mount to the wall and have different types of paint. Um, and this, this sits on a pedestal. So I'm gonna end with something that has no iron in it, but to talk about relationships with students, um, because this team, um, the people I've worked with so long showed images of places I've been. And, and I, 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 as I was digging through my images and wanting to put keen foundry pictures in, I thought, no, those surely they're gonna be covered. So I just didn't do it. And this is a project that happened a few years ago at 500X where we um, professors were asked to collaborate with a former student. And so I collaborated with Julie McKendrick who uh, did her undergraduate degree at TWU and then went on to UNT in um, new media and worked with David Stout and um, so, just how things come back, you know, this brought um, <clears throat> this working uh, way of working. She's very much about things like creating an instrument that reads light and converts it to sound. And I'm sorry, I don't have video of this, but <clears throat> I use these rotating motors, Colby's disco ball mold motors to spin these um, big, plexiglass uh, tubes and we had speakers and we had this set up where it was reading the light coming off of the video and transferring that to sound which ironically sounded very much like uh, Yellowstone National Park the the features in the um, geothermal features that are emitting sounds and so I I now, as I'm saying this, I, I realize I have not, uh, I didn't tell Julie about this. Um, I feel really bad, but hopefully with this recording, I can give her the opportunity. She's an amazing artist, amazing musician. Some of you may know her. Anyway, with that, um, before I go into a bad coughing fit, I think what I want to do, <laughs> thank you. Um, I did go a little longer than I had tended to, um, I would really like to turn it over to everybody for Q&A, um, people in the audience, uh, panelists, um, and faculty, everybody who's here. I see Sabine Seth from uh, Texas Sculpture Group. Uh, thank you. Welcome. I saw you come in. And um, so I'm not sure who else is here, if we have any um, International Sculpture Center people, but um, nope, but we've got Sabine, which is the same thing. Uh, and anyway, thank you so much, everybody. Let's, I, I, let's give a big applause to everybody, the panelists, and then let's have a q and <laughs> I'm the only one clapping because everyone's muted. So let's take it away. We want some questions. So since there are, thank you guys so much, but since there are um, some students in the room that are um, female and also participated in the iron pour, I wanted to uh, direct this question to Tanya and Erin. 
um, and then even Sabine too, because you're here, um, about um, just what it's like being in a predominantly, uh, maybe as Luke put it, sausage world. Uh, <laughs> and so, um, you know, and, and so, you know, just advice to young women getting into the field, especially in terms of like iron, um, what advice might you give them for like Caddy and, and Kelly and um, yeah. Who wants to start? <laughs> I mean, I can speak, uh, Luke says that and I, I totally see what he means. I would say for me having, when I think about back to when I went to like my first boards or conferences, the community has grown and changed a lot. Like I, I feel that, I don't know the numbers, but I, I feel there's more of a balance. And I know that this has been a conversation in the iron community at conferences and stuff is that for me, I feel more, uh, I experience more issues with being a female when I go to Home Depot. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like when I go to an iron core conference, I find that we're all just talking about, you know, we're working as artists. Yes, sometimes you're going to have someone that's like maybe, you know, trying to be on a, you know, overly macho thing, but I've always felt very much just welcomed and respected. And um, yeah, just that level of respect. I, and I find it more there than I do other places, honestly is that people take me seriously. I think with it, with the iron community, it's like, you show up and do the work, you know? And it's like, if you show up and you, you know, you do the work, but you're, you can, you're humble when you don't know, like the other thing, well, okay. I will say for a don't be afraid to ask for help though, too. I see that happen a lot where it's like, no, I'm super tough. I'm going to do this all myself. I was like, I don't want to carry a 50 pound bag of sand. If someone's going to come up and offer that help, it's like, you take that help. But I I've, have found um, over the years and now that it seems to be pretty balanced in terms of, you know, you know, female identifying, you know, as far as gender goes in relation to, you know, uh, male at those conferences, it's pretty balanced. And I, I've always felt very much welcomed and like just an equal um, level of respect. And it might be something that some people have a different experience, but for me, I find that surprisingly more in this community than I probably do in certain other areas. I, I want to second that. Um, it's true. It is, um, it, you know, my professor in grad school was very cowboy. You know, he kind of had a macho look. He had boots on. He was, he, he you know, but you might look um, out on the foundry floor and it would be norm with women. There were no guys out there. And I remember standing there with his wife and his wife she went, said, look at Norm and all his women. And, but he never made you feel, you know, um, strange um, in any way. You know, it was, there was no sense of it, but it can be, I mean, it just by nature, we're very, it's almost like a blue collar, you know, I think maybe Kurt once at a, uh, I don't remember where we were, but you mentioned something. We were all sitting in a restaurant with these badge or, you know, Atomic Iron Commission or something he said, look at us. We all look like we're wearing blue uniforms and very blue collar. <laughs> and it, it's true. It's kind of a real worker mentality. But for women, I would say, you know, I think it's natural to pour metal and watching the students at TWU jump in there, um, watching uh, uh, Kelsey, Dee Dee, oh my gosh, um, Misty, um, just jump in. And there was no thought of, wow, oh, I shouldn't do this. But I think sculpture in general can kind of be seen when you look at those more traditional things like metal casting or welding or even woodworking to extent can seem that way and um but i think yeah i i, I have to go back to what aaron said yeah it's it's when you get out there when in, in like going to donnie king's foundry 
I, I couldn't believe one of my undergrads, I uh, should have thrown a slide in of that, but remember how I, I couldn't imagine him letting someone drive the forklift and load the big sand hopper. And here she is like zooming around on there. And he, she, he didn't, she didn't have to go through forklift training. And I remember thinking, oh dear, please don't let anything happen, you know, because she was very good at what driving forklift. And Donnie Keene, who comes from a much earlier generation than all of us, had no problem with it. He just kept an eye on it. And um, so it's a time for women. If this kind of work is, uh, this kind of medium interests you, uh, there's no, I'd just say, claim your space and kind of kick some butt and make art though. Keep, you know, be sure and, and remember it's seductive and you can lose track of, you don't want to just pour ingots and then end up with a doorstop chunk that you don't like. So it's, sometimes that's normal at first to do a few of those. But. I think in the beginning, but I also like to piggyback, like, it goes back to what Luke said, and you reiterate, it's important to keep that in mind as we're there to make art too. Oh. Yeah. All right. I, will, I will add one thing because you, you called on, my, on me earlier. I mean, my background is in stone sculpture actually. And by the way, it's fabulous to see all your people again here. I haven't seen you in so long, <laughs> go to USG. Um, but stone sculpture is the same way. I've done bronze as well. And women, the moment you show up and you do the work, you stand your man. You 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 prove it by doing it. The fact that you're there uh, gains you the respect. If you're not doing the work, you won't gain any respect in any discipline. It doesn't matter where you go. And if anything, then I really think that the 2D arts and uh, what we would deem the, the fancy arts are more... Um, gender divided than sculpture is, because sculpture is physical. You have to put the work in one way or another, and it doesn't matter whether it's stone, metal, bronze, crossed iron. And I think it's a very leveling field just by nature. That's really true. That's very, I think it's, gosh, the, yeah, I don't want to get off on some ranting right now about <laughs> sometimes gender things, but um, come on, students, you've got to have questions for these amazing people. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, since no one has a question, I'm going to add into this because I just think that um, I think any time that you have the division, it can't be good. And I've always said that you know, pouring metal is not a contact sport. It's about being smart and being thoughtful and working together. And that's how I've always treated it. And I always try to get people to refrain from using violent terms like kick butt. How's that one for you, Tanya? <laughs> because it's not about that. It's not about kicking ass. That sounds like some jack wagon on some TV program, but either way, that's my two cents. I've always been inclusive, never exclusive. And I, and I can say that for everybody I've met in the cast metal area. Well, I'm gonna kick your butt later. Um, <laughs> no, very good. Um, I agree, Kurt, that's a good point that inclusive. Um, I've got a question um, for everyone, I guess. Um, I was wondering, um, how do you, how, how did you kind of like find out that um, material that you wanted to continue working with or a concept that like um, you had been thinking about? Um, what was it like? And like, what was that moment like for you to find out like, this is what I'm doing? And when did you know that you wanted to continue doing it? I'll just touch on that in that um, I think in high school, I took a pottery class and I discovered my hands. So I was a really solid DC student in high school. Um, 
And then all of a sudden I discovered these things. And when I went on to college uh, to be a potter, then all of a sudden I was introduced to woodworking, metalworking, uh, hot and cold glass, uh, you name it. I mean, it, just video, all of these things were introduced and, and I tried everything. Uh, I ended up focusing mostly with wood um, because I think that's the people who were challenging me and yet kind of taking me under their wing. When I got out, <clears throat> I didn't want to go to graduate school and I worked jobs. So I worked jobs in, uh, you know, a big milling operation doing woodworking. I took jobs um, building furniture. I took jobs in a welding shop and I built skills. Um, 15 years after that, I went back to graduate school and my skills were, were beyond most of the faculty that were at the institution because I had done them every single day. So I was doing these large steel fabricated pieces, um, which I, I really enjoyed. Um, but I found myself starting to go back to wood, going back to this thing that, that I had initially been attracted to. And uh, it's just amazing to me how all of those other things that I did influence what I do with wood now. Uh, so it doesn't negate that I worked with steel or I cast, I'd never casted iron until there was a, a conference in Tyler and I met Kurt and all of a sudden it was like, wow, I can, I can break Coke. <laughs> and, uh, so all those things play a role in the development of who you are as you grow as an artist. Thank you, Phil, that was really good. Um, I want to just say to Janice, thank you for that question. That's a good question too. I, I want to just um, touch on that briefly. When I knew, well, I will say when I saw the potential in a certain material, uh, but I'm not so sure it didn't go back to me. Uh, early impressions as a child. My dad had a bronze furnace that the lid lifted up instead of the kind of the um, just kind of the right way it went. Um, and I remember that. And I remember the, 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 the deafening silence when the, when the uh, blower was shut off. It was like a sacred time where all of a sudden there was molten metal and you knew that something was very different. Um, and you see these people in big aluminized suits pull the metal up out of the furnace. And I, I guess that early impression as a four-year-old in the bushes at night watching, you know, and uh, because I wasn't allowed to get um, near it, um, of course. And uh, um, so then, you know, through, you know, I didn't want to do that. I was going to raise horses and be a, a trainer. And then I was going to be a farrier and, um, and then, um, went back, just realized one day that, I don't know how to explain this, but it was as though I was going to peel inside out if I didn't make art. And, uh, and then the rest was history. You go to college and um, start really putting that energy into making art. Uh, but for me, Jane, it was, um, for me, I saw the potential in bronze and that's all I wanted to do. I was pretty closed off to other things. Then I learned welding. Then I learned um, iron. But I think it was that attraction to this, this molten metal. And then the good thing about that is it took me other places where I started thinking about experience, sound, video. Um, and then it didn't matter what medium it was. So um, I think that you'll feel you'll start I think as a as a begin as an artist who's developing we're all still developing uh, 
but something will start snapping and feeling right. You'll see some doors open and, um, and of course, don't limit yourself to any one material. I kind of focused on that myself, uh, but that was my thing. I had to do it. And, um, um, but it's, it was my own self limiting. Um, but that moment, I, I would say, when you finally make something that you feel like is working and, and interesting, and then you get an idea of what the next thing might be. You just know it needs to be whatever process or technique or way that there's something else to happen that will happen, that can happen. So um, other comments and questions, please? How many people we have? Ariel, you're here. Caddy, I don't mean to call you <laughs> out, but hi. Hi. Um, I actually I don't have question, but I have some feeling that I really enjoy the iron pour that day. That was really fun. That that was my first time. Uh, uh, like doing this stuff and um, I found it it is really fun to make a mold and that satisfaction that I have the like iron things that I make myself that 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 was really fun yeah Ariel you did great <laughs> I remember you were on I think one of the last taps there <laughs> yeah thank you and yeah, and Everyone I, did. I, I hope I have a, like a stronger body to make 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 those stuff because that that was really heavy. Yeah, but that's part of the communities. We're all here to kind of like just help each other out. Again, you know, it's like I asked Tanya to step in when I need some help. But yeah, y'all y'all did great. Those that are on here that were at the poor is is awesome. Thank you, Ariel. Didi, you've got a question or comment, I know. Hi, um, I, you know, I had such a wonderful time. I have been looking forward to this iron pour for like three years. Basically, since I came back to school, it's been like kind of in the works and I'm like, oh my God, you know, um, and, it, and it's coming. And then, you know, my molds kept failing and it was so frustrating. And I was like, I, you know, maybe I can't do this. And then, you know, of course I can. Um, and my molds turned out great and I'm super excited. And I just, I loved it so much. Like it is the most fun I have had in years. Like no lie. Um, I, I don't really have any questions right now. Um, I'm just, um, you know, I am graduating next semester with my BFA. Um, and so if anyone has any type of advice for things, um, you know, as an emerging artist that is super interested in metal work and um, making a difference with it, that would be really awesome. And I just, you know, I do want to thank all of you so much for coming and also for sharing your work with us and your stories. Um, it was an incredible experience and I'm truly grateful I got to participate in it. Thank you. My, my uh, main advice for picking a grad school is go somewhere that they'll pay for it you know uh there's lots and lots of places out there that are uh willing to to foot the bill and i think that's important um obviously you want to go somewhere where you're you're gonna want you know whatever instructor or professor relates to your work and whatever whatever place for you know, relates to what you want to do. But uh, I think that that's a real big, important thing. There's nothing worse than saddling, so, saddling yourself with 60 to $100,000 debt right out of grad school. And then you're, you know, you're kind of behind the eight ball. So that, that's my, my two cents on, on grad school. Yeah. And, and I would add on to uh, what Luke said by 
stating that you should consider the facilities that are available at your at, at the graduate at the graduate school when you go there. And the moment you walk on the campus and into the program, I think the primary thing that you need to do is to do an attitude switch where you just function as an artist that's in school. You know, and that uh, and, and it's best, I, I believe, if you go into the experience with sort of like a strong idea that you have like a need to express, explore and want to give two years of uh, really serious consideration to and you have peers and faculty that you can use to sort of uh, challenge, poke and prod um, your ideas. And the last thing that I would say is that that graduate school, uh, your, your peers are more important than the professors because they're gonna form your principal professional contacts after you leave. And you'll find that these are gonna be the people that are gonna help you to do work that are going to know about you and be able to give you like recommendations of places that they may be working. So it's really important not to isolate yourself during graduate school and really uh, become part of a part of an artistic community. Very good. That's really good advice. Um, I, you know, it's hard. It's hard with money, you know. And uh, I'm always telling students, you know, oh, I want to see you go to grad school, but don't get in debt, you know, find a school that you can, um, you're not going to borrow and, and lose all, you know, go into a debt that you're spending your life paying. I, I did that. <laughs> I can't say um, I, you know, regret it. I don't, but I, I don't think it's good to do. So the other thing I would say as a piece of advice is uh, my tendency is to say, don't go from undergrad right to graduate school. Give yourself some time to discover if, if you get out and you don't make work, then there's no sense in going to graduate school. Uh, if you go out and you, you can't help but make work, uh, I was 15 years between undergrad and graduate school. The only reason I got into graduate school was I was making work all the time and I was showing. And so that, that is so important. Uh, and so many people, I think, jump immediately and then life takes hold and they don't make work. Uh, so see how, passion, how passionate your, your drive is to make work. I would say the opposite. Finish your undergrad, go to grad school. It's going to be a lot of work. Get it done. That's it. And don't spend a lot of money. I only spent a thousand dollars three years. I'm happy. I didn't take out any loans. <laughs> I didn't have debt, but I went to a good school. Sorry, Phil. Just had to disagree with you. <laughs> I mean, I side with Phil to a point, yeah. Except that like when he said that if you're not making work, I think for me, I took a year off, but I went as a metals undergrad and I was like, well, I knew metals and jewelry making sort of a long, I knew the techniques. So I was like, I'm gonna, I got a job in a jewelry design gallery doing like high-end jewelry but they wouldn't let me in the back. I just was on the floor doing sales, but I learned about the business aspect of a lot of things. But then I got to a point where it was just like, I had started something I was really interested in when I left the Art Institute. And then it was just like going into doing jewelry design. I said, this isn't what fulfills me. I'm not a good business person. This isn't gonna be my thing. I really wanna evolve more and develop more as an artist. And so, um, you know, and I applied UT, I went to, it was like my wild card school. I don't know, things just, for me, I feel like my trajectory is like, I didn't get one thing, but something else has come from that. So I think for everyone else, it's different. But um, I think it's a lot different right now too. I know a lot of people take a different 
route and trajectory, you know, and I talk about that a lot with my students at UT and my freshman students is I have a lot of friends, a lot of people I see coming out of school that are finding different avenues and getting into starting spaces and curating or, you know, other things that keep them very creative that doesn't, you know, necessarily lead them to grad school. So it's, it's changed a lot. I will say that. I agree about the money. Try to don't go into debt. That's really good insight. I, uh, I, I don't know why, but I took the 10 year undergrad plan. So I graduated with some huge amount of hours because, you know, I, I started in art at a small liberal arts college in Oklahoma refused to take anything but art and ended up at the um, like 400 level, hadn't even taken English comp and uh, then realized, oh, I need to do all these other things. Um, so I, you know, meanwhile, I'm moving around in different places. Um, and there was a, a, a period of time where I followed a boyfriend to Dallas and lived in a an industrial warehouse in on Industrial Avenue or Industrial Boulevard with uh, um, with my boyfriend who had a job in a foundry and um, lived with this professional artist who other artist who um, who was an artist who worked at um, Eastfield Community College he taught there but then he was a Neiman Marcus Tech at night he worked at Neiman Marcus. And so he really worked hard to make art. And um, so I was in the eighties, you know, like barely 21, hanging out with um, these artists. And it almost became, it came a different type of university. You started learning about professional art. At the time, uh, the head of International Sculpture Center came in and juried a show here. And so absorb is what I'm trying to get to is whatever you're doing, be absorb it. You know, like Andrew mentioned that mindset of being a, um, an artist in school. I don't know that that's only in school, you know, um, keep learning and keep, keep getting that energy. And so by the time I worked my way back to undergrad to finish up and take all those courses and like have to start over again in the art degree because um, the professor didn't want to transfer anything at the time. Um, I, uh, I was then, I did what Kurt said, I went straight through, you know, but there were gaps in that 10 year uh, undergraduate program. And I'm kind of, I don't know how many hours that was, uh, but I have a lot of hours as an undergrad and then, went on to graduate school, but there was the need, there was something more. I didn't go to graduate school to teach. I didn't go to graduate school to get a job. I went to graduate school because I knew I needed to go to that next level. I needed a, a higher challenge. And um, I went in humble, you know, like I wanna learn, you know, I know these things. I already know things, but I'm not here to just act like I know something. I'm here to learn new things. And, um, and, and it does, it challenges you. If you're, you're at a good program that's a match, you will, you will strive to go to that higher level in your work. Anyway, any other questions? Because we're getting on to, we've been, we've running into, uh, it's almost seven at 6.50. And I want to give people a chance to have any comments or questions before we, um, before we say good night. I have to depart company. I gotta go pick up my daughter. Thank you, Kurt. <laughs> Thank you so much. All You're right. amazing. Thank you, Kurt. Bye-bye. Love you all. Bye. Hey, Kurt. Good to see you, Kurt. I gotta run too. I gotta graduates opening or closing reception, so. <laughs> <laughs>
All right. Well, thanks, everybody. I think it's a good, good sign. Good to see you, Phil. Say goodbye. And yeah. Thanks, everybody. everyone. Mm -hmm. Till next time.